And there we go. Let's make sure it is as live as it says it is. This is the awkward part. I feel like the people that watch this later uh, <laughs> feel kind of awkward about it, about like this portion of the, because this is me kind of babbling to be like, is it live? Are we going to do it? There goes Rockfin. Rockfin, we're going live on the Rockfin. And let me make sure I am live on Twitter as well, because I kind of did this in a different way. Cool. I am live on Twitter. That's awesome. Okay. And I believe I'm also live on the on the Facebooks as well. Uh, those two, I will probably, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to continue being um, live on Facebook and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, only because, <clears throat> well, they suck. Uh, that's that's the that's the only reason I would I would not go live on them, is because they're they're not particularly great, right? Like that's that's the reality of of those platforms. But for now, it's it's easy and it's quick and it's what I kind of need to do. Um, so, and you guys kind of know the drill here. The first couple minutes of this, I am going to just real quick. Share this into some groups just so we get we, we we get some folks that I know would like to come hang out. Uh, that they do get to come hang out. So pardon my uh, awkward little share moment here. I'm not gonna go as crazy as I normally do with these shares. Um, just gonna kind of do this real quick. I hope you guys can hear me okay. If you guys can hear me okay, or or you can't hear me okay, uh, leave a comment and uh, and I will make sure that the audio is is fixed for the rest of the stream. Uh, yeah, cool. Uh, well, that's all done. And while we're while we're waiting for everybody to kind of come and hang out with us on the stream, while I just did that, I'm gonna encourage you guys. To do the same thing, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button. Please make sure that you share this and you are subscribed to whatever you're watching this on. Uh, if you're watching this on Twitter, then follow me on Twitter. If you're watching this on Facebook, make sure that you are, you know, still uh, a person that likes my page because uh, sometimes they'll do that. They'll just get rid of people that like my page. Uh, if you're watching this on Rockfin, which I think everybody should be watching this on Rockfin, should head right over to rockfin.com slash krishmohanhaha. Uh, please make sure you hit the like and share. That's the big one I want to get out there. If you're watching this on the YouTubery uh, later or listen to the audio podcast, yeah, make sure you're subscribed to get notifications of when I drop new videos. Um, but while we're waiting uh, and and we're when we're getting things kicked off, I am a little early today, too. That's the other thing. I said I would be going live around 4 uh, and technically it is around four. It's not exactly four. Um, I do want to talk about a couple of show dates that I have coming up, um, virtual shows and one live show that I'm pretty excited about. December 10th, I'm going to be hosting a virtual show over Zoom. Uh, it's a fundraiser for the Pittsburgh DSA's project called Feed the Hood. Uh, it's a mutual aid project that they're working on. So they're raising funds to make sure that they can continue doing it um, for long-term capacity, right? For, for as long as they can. And it's going to take, uh, funds from the people. They're, they're, they're not looking at, uh, fucking government funding or private corporate, corporate funding. They're looking for citizen funding. Um, the, the people get to fund this thing and, and help them out. So December 10th, um, I'm hosting a, a fundraiser for that. And we've got Amy, mm -hmm, fantastic musician out of Pittsburgh on the, on the show. Uh, we got a dear friend of mine, Zach Funk, on the show. We got Lorenzo De Silvio, who's one of my favorite comedians in town right now, uh, and Stacy Florim, who is also incredible, one of the best writers in the city. Uh, so we've got a, a really amazing lineup for you guys. Uh, so I highly encourage you guys to go grab tickets for that. Uh, December 11th, I'm doing another virtual show. It's a, it's the Citizen Revolution. It's a virtual stand-up comedy show of my full hour. Um, so I'm going to be doing that on December 11th. So if you miss that, or if I was supposed to come to your town this year and couldn't because of, uh, of the pandemic, uh, situation, uh, then this, this would be the opportunity to come catch that show. Uh, December 17th, I'm doing a forkful of noodles recording over zoom. So if you're interested in that, 
uh, come grab tickets for that. Where the topic uh, is going to be China. Big topic here to close out the year is China. That's that's the topic I'm going to be discussing. And last but not least, if you're in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, for all my Pittsburgh friends, uh, or if you're coming to Pittsburgh over the holidays, if you used to live here and you're coming to Pittsburgh over the holidays, December 18th, mark your calendars, because I am going to be headlining at the Fun House at Mr. Small's uh, for the Fun House Mirror Comedy Shows. These are new monthly comedy shows. I'm headlining this one December 18th. Uh, grab those tickets. All of those tickets are going to be available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Okay, we'll probably go over all of that stuff at the end of the program. Uh, and you guys know the drill on how this thing works here. I've got a couple of stories that we are going to dive into. Um, I'm going to talk about it and then at the end of it we'll look at your your comments we will uh and and uh we'll we'll do a little discussion and as usual uh you usually i don't have a problem uh in in my streams but so every so often uh you do find dicks that come in and um uh, you know, uh, say some awful shitty things. If you do, uh, that won't be tolerated. Your comment will go ignored. You will go ignored. Uh, so just be cool. Even if we have a disagreement about the point, uh, about the topic in, in question, uh, even if we have a disagreement, uh, that's okay. Just be respectful and kind in your disagreement. That is something that we all can do. We can put some effort into that as human beings. And that's what we need to do as people in order to become a society uh, that uh, values critical thinking. So, you know, just uh, just 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 be a nice person. Lastly, there is a delay on Rockfin as well. There's quite there's there's a good, decent delay on Rockfin. So uh, Rockfin commenters, if 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 uh, I don't if, if I miss a comment or two. Or if I if I can't figure out what your comment is about, that's that's why because of the delay. But uh, let's do it, guys. Let's get into the let's get into these stories. So this was big news. This was big news last year, last week. I was very excited uh, to to see these stories come out. Uh, I was super super pumped about it. Uh, the Indian farmers, uh, after a year of striking, after a whole year of of striking. Uh, have won. They defeated the neoliberal laws. The the three uh, neoliberal laws that the Indian government, the Modi administration, uh, wanted to put out there that would pretty much bring uh, foreign private businesses into India and take over the agricultural sector, uh, which, you know, uh, I think like over 50 percent of uh, Indian workers work within um, in, in some way, shape or form. I mean, this is the thing. This is the industry that feeds a billion people in India. Fifty uh, percent of them would have would have been completely screwed, completely fucked. Primarily, the minimum price, uh, what is it called? Minimum support pricing is what it's called. Uh, that basically says that regardless of what happens, this is the minimum price for this grain. So you know, um, private co uh, companies and large scale retailers cannot try to cheat the farmers um, out of what they need to make in order to sustain and grow corps, uh, grow corps, grow crops for the following year. Right. Uh, they, uh, feel like I should clarify Indian farmers, not growing corpses. That would be a weird thing. How would you even grow corpse? Uh, that doesn't logically make any sense, but, uh, but here's what Modi said, right? This is this is what Modi said. Modi basically said he failed to persuade a section of farmers despite his best efforts. Failed to persuade a section of farmers despite his best efforts. Uh, that, my friends, is, is code for, uh, fuck, my propaganda didn't work. Damn it. I wish my propaganda would have worked, and it didn't. That's what that fucking means. Right. Uh, Vijay Prasad, who's a fantastic journalist, fantastic Indian journalist. Uh, and I, I, I am fond of Vijay Prasad. I always get very excited when I see like positive um, brown role models to look into, especially positive lefty brown role models, because we don't have a lot of those in our in our society. Uh, 
You know, it's like I'm not going to fucking line up with Bobby Jindal, that megalomaniacal psychopath. Now, I've been compared enough to Aziz Ansari that I don't need to count him as a fucking role model for anything. But Vijay Prasad points out that what this likely means is uh, he's going to come back, come back with something uh, new and and po- and possibly equally as bad, if not worse, than what we saw here. So the fight, though we won the battle, does not mean the war against you know uh, neoliberal efforts to take over the agricultural sector of India is over, uh, because it's not. Um, they they're probably going to try to come out with a different method of propaganda the, than than you know kind of fighting back against the direct action of a strike, um, because th- through and through. Everybody that talked about it, everybody that covered it, basically saw it as uh, the the state uh, kind of attacking their citizens, right? And, and that's how they were convincing them. So, uh, and and really, the problem in Modi's mind isn't the farm laws; it, it, it's not the neoliberalism, but it is it is the manner in which the neoliberalism was being sold to the people. Uh, it, it it wasn't being sold in the best way possible, right? That's that's what Modi is really saying with with statements like he didn't persuade a section of farmers, right? He didn't he didn't he didn't co-opt the union fast enough is essentially what he's talking about. Um, he didn't really let farmers down. Uh, you know, and the methods that he was using, the the you know, the what what he claims, the the methods he claims he's using um were Essentially, to use cops to attack unarmed activists, right? A lot of these, a lot of these farmers that were going on strike uh, were older folks. They were they were in their fifties, sixties, old Sardarjis, you know, from from uh, Punjab and Gujarat, Rajasthan. These are these are old cats, man. They're not young dudes. I'm I'm a I'm a young dude compared to them. I'm kind of middle aged now, uh, but middle age is young compared to a lot of these farmers. Yeah, these are these are people in fucking in their fifties and sixties, man. Gray beards all around. They're not they're not out there looking to start a physical brawl with somebody. For fuck's sake, if you if you're out there looking to start a physical brawl with somebody, you don't understand what direct action is about. You don't understand what the labor movement is about, and you need to get the fuck out of here. The other thing that he tried uh, with his methods of propaganda was just outright smearing them, right? Smearing them and, and claiming that um, uh, who who was it? Amit Shah, that was the gentleman's name. Uh, I don't remember what bullshit position he has in politics, uh, but he basically came out and said that, uh, you know, some of these guys are Sikhs and they're tied to Sikh terror. Uh, and Muslim terror and 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 they're and they're here to uh, they're here to come come out uh, and they're coming in to eat Indian babies. That's what they're doing. OK, that's what this this strike, the fact that they're they're not working and, and, and the agricultural sector in India is is coming to a grinding halt means that they they are encouraging you to eat babies. Boom. That who you want to support baby eaters. That was that was basically the propaganda that. The BJP Amit Shah was was throwing out there, falsely equating them with terrorists, um, you know. And this is like this is insulting the intelligence of the of the Indian populace, of the globe, world populace, the people that were paying attention to this. Very insulting to their intelligence. Then they use water cannons. They also cut internet access for journalists so that they couldn't publish what they what they were actually seeing. They couldn't do any sort of live streaming, um, uh, on the ground reporting, or any of that sort of stuff, because the internet access was cut off. Right. Uh, then they used barbed wire and fencing to block the protesters from entering cities like Delhi and New Delhi uh, to to protest. Right in the capital of the nation. In the in the in the in the the government center of the country, to really show that they're against these laws, that these laws are not on their side. So these were the methods of propaganda that they were using, and he's saying, "Ah, oh, didn't convince you by beating the shit out of you and lying about you. It didn't work. It didn't. You didn't back down." Now the reason why this is so exciting. 
I for for me it, as as someone that is a fan of history and I and I know I've I've talked about these topics pretty endlessly here but I do believe that in the 30s the labor movement you know we we had some pretty major victories it's just we didn't hold on to those victories and so to me th that's what is happening here um in the 30s FDR used the military to go after uh, striking workers. And when the striking workers started fighting back against the National Guard, against the cops, and against the military, and, and it did get violent because capitalists made it violent, um, FDR had no other option. He was out of options. He, he you know, that, that's basically the capitalist option is the, the capitalists will use violence against the labor movement and against the socialists and then claim that they're being violent when they retaliate in self-defense. And that's the first option these capitalists will go to. Because that's the only thing they have, right? Like, the only thing they have is brute motherfucking force. That's why the military is such an important part um, of any capitalist regime. That's why a strong police, a more authoritarian police force is, is important for a strong capitalist government. But in the 30s, it didn't work. And when and when the people were ready to fight back, which is what this country is built on, right? Fundamentally, at the core, that's what we're told this country is built on. They, they don't have any other recourse but to sit down and, and talk it out. So this is, this is basically the same thing. Now, a decade later, the American government came up with uh, the Taft-Hartley bill, which gutted unions and basically killed the labor movement and and killed the working uh, working class of America. And I think that's that's the next phase of uh, of what's coming from the Modi regime. But but they won. They won because no matter how much violence they fucking. Um, throw at the strikers the fact that they didn't back down meant that they had to come up with something else and eventually i mean it, this would have become an unignorable thing and so that's what the but the, that's what the media did the media kind of ignored it right uh because indian media much like american media uh largely silent about the world's largest strike by the way this was the world like 250 million people last year uh thanksgiving of 2020 went on a general strike and there was maybe one CNN article about it that kind of said that it was it was bullshit. And Indian media, much like American media, is owned and operated by billionaires, billionaires that have their you know fingers in various different other pies as well. You know, and how is that different, right? I mean, Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post, so that means he gets to control the narrative. So what did they win? They won the reinstatement of that minimum support price I mentioned earlier, which was which was super fucking important. Uh, the other thing that they were talking about, and this was not particularly, uh, th this wasn't this this detail wasn't really hit upon as hard even by the leftist journalists because the minimum support pricing uh, was really really the big thing um, that was kind that that the farmers were kind of really worried about, right? Uh, but there there was also this electricity amendment. Uh, which would basically put rural elect electricity in the hands of private corporations. Uh, and anytime you put uh, public utilities in the hands of private corporations, no matter where it is, and, and examples of this exist all across America, no matter where it is, when public utilities go into the hands of the private sector, the prices will go up. Why? Because it's about endless profit. It's about making as much money as humanly possible and and provide less of a service, right? Because what these people, what these CEOs and everything are, are trying to do is to make the most amount of money with the least amount of work, but really meaning all of the money with no work. And that's not me just saying that. That's just what the trends dictate. Every time a public utility gets privatized, this happens. So these farmers aren't stupid. Again, uh, you know, the, the, these politicians are trying to insult the intelligence of the farmers by telling them how the economy 
works according to the lies of neoliberalism. And they figured out exactly how this system works, exactly what the problem with capitalism and neoliberalism is, and they push back against it. Now, the BJP is sticking to the fact that these bills that they're putting out there are meant to help these farmers. But they have yet to come out and prove that fact. Where where are you helping these farmers? What about what you're setting up is meant to help these farmers? They haven't been able to prove that fact at all. And they just kind of want you to take their word for it. Right? The invisible hand of the free market will guide you. It won't. It'll push you off a cliff and you wouldn't you you don't even know that's what happened. That's what the invisible hand of the free market actually does. The pattern in capitalism is that working class farmers could lose everything to make the free market richer. That's it. That's all this would do. So I, I'm I'm very excited that they won. I'm very excited that they're repealing these laws. But I'm I'm uh, also cautiously optimistic because I know the patterns of behavior when of, of capitalists when it comes to these sort of victories. Um, and it's not, you know, uh, it's it's not okay. Yeah, we lost. Okay, we'll we'll listen to what you guys have to say and write laws based on that. It's okay. Yeah, we lost. Let's figure out a different tactic um, and write more strict more strict laws. Uh, and say, well, it can either be this law or the previous iteration of the law that you guys fought, right? Uh, so, so things to kind of keep in mind. Things to kind of keep in mind. Uh, okay, I'm gonna look at your comments. But um, bum, but um, bum. I gotta scroll up here. Holly, good to see you. Dingo ate me, baby. Good to see you over on the Rockfin. Uh, <laughs> Dingo says neoliberalism is growing corpses anywhere it takes root. Damn, man, that's some dark poetry right there. That is some dark poetry, Dingo. I love it. I love it. Uh, Holly, that's what victory looked like. Holly says hard won victories, uh, the military company and goons. Yeah, and company goons. Yeah, uh, that that's that's basically who they would have to fight in that in that instance is is the military and company goons. Uh, in in the case of India, it was primarily cops. Uh, cops were the ones that were going after the because because what are cops other than the guards of the rich? Right. That's that's all they are. They're they're just state run Pinkertons. That's that's really what cops are. Uh, and and that's that's on a global level too. It's it's not just because. Uh, 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 you, you know, I'm just saying that because it's fun to say. I'm saying that on a global level. That's what cops are. Uh, co co cops are the glo global Pinkertons. They are they are they are mercenaries for hire, um, but by, by the state. It's just they're paid by the state nonstop, right? When you get when you when you become a cop, you you just work. You're protecting rich people's stuff, man. That's that's what cops do. That's what cops always have done. That's the history of policing, especially in America, right? So yeah, I'm I'm excited about this. Cautiously optimistic, I will say. Cautiously optimistic. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm uh, starting off with a little good news. How about that? Not bad, huh? Now, onward to some fucking weird shit. Because this is, and, and you guys know, uh, if, you're, if you're seeing the title here, what the hell happened to Tulsi Gabbard, uh, you guys know I've complained about Tulsi's uh, recent policies. Uh, you know, it was it, 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 Misty Misty Winston and I talked about it. Comrade Misty and I talked about it. it it's very very strange. And and if you are, um, it, you know, you are somebody that cares and are principled. It doesn't matter what politician you claimed as your favorite politician. And I'm not shy about saying that I supported Tulsi uh, in 2019. I absolutely did. And then she started becoming a disappointment in 2020, uh, you know, when she stopped running and basically backed Biden and now is slowly making this, this has slowly been making this shift to the right where last December I was, you know, she kind of 
stepped away from Congress. And right before she did, uh, she had put these bills out um, uh, about Assange, protecting Assange, and why it's important that the United States doesn't extradite Julian Assange. And she got conservatives on board with that. And I was like, holy shit, wow, okay, that's awesome. And then right after that, she came out with this Title IX bullshit where she wanted to exclude trans athletes from getting uh, scholarships, sports scholarships, which might be the only way that these kids get to go to college because America is a country where college is so expensive that you need to have some kind of skill that the college can exploit in order for you to get some kind of deal on education, right? And so in order for them to get these scholarships, to get the education they want, Tulsi Gabbard basically said, no, you, they, they shouldn't because they're trans athletes. And hormones and biology and so on and so forth. Instead of thinking, well, what's an inclusive way we could make this work, right? It was, let, let's exclude. And it was very strange because she had 100% rating with the HRC. She put out these bills that helped the LGBT community. So what the fuck happened? Why did she make this super 180? And it's gotten worse, right? Like this year, it's gotten significantly worse. Like every time she's put out something, I'm like, like where the fuck is this coming from? This is like the polar opposite of the type of shit you were saying when you were running for president. Like the polar opposite of the shit that made me go, hell yeah, man, that's that's awesome. I'm glad to hear a politician say shit like that. She was anti-war. She was pro-universal health care. So let's go through it, right? Uh, I'm going to try something new. All right, cool. So here we go. Maybe we'll go to this screen. Yep. I haven't done this presentation thing, so hopefully it works out okay. Uh, so this is the quote from uh, my good friend Lee Camp. Uh, he says, we've seen a near 180 from Tulsi Gabbard this year. Her opinions on many subjects are now indecipherable from Fox News, which is why they've been inviting her on regularly. Lee Camp, a political comedian who's followed Tulsi Gabbard's uh, career trajectory closely, told Ben Press, adding, many of her tweets seem to pretend race is not an issue in America, a country with overwhelming white supremacist foreign and domestic policy. Much of her ire and concern has shifted from those without health care to those refugees coming through our, quote, open borders. Uh, Tulsi now feeds into the toxic nationalism and xenophobia that has allowed the American empire to abuse other people's cultures for generations, ironically, including white America's annexation of her home state, Hawaii. So uh, let's look at some of these flips, right? We're going to look at some of the flips that uh, that she's had. Uh, first and foremost is the anti-war flip. That was the biggest thing that that made me support Tulsi Gabbard was the fact that she was a vehement anti-war anti-war politician. Uh, the late great Mike Gravel, somebody that everybody should should follow and learn about. Um, he was he was saying that the two candidates in the, in the in the 2020 uh, political theater show that we were all being witness to. The, do, 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 uh, the two candidates that he thought had the most merit and qualifications to lead were Bernie Sanders and Tulsi Gabbard because of their uh, anti-interventionist, anti-regime change wars, uh, anti-war foreign policies. That's why. And, and that was one of the reasons why I was like, holy shit, she is critical of the United States military. She is cr critical of the regime change wars. Uh, and she's and she's saying them outright uh, as she's talking about economic sanctions being economic warfare, something we that America does nonstop against countries that they don't like socialist democracies that don't allow them to come in and, and just take resources willy nilly. Right. Uh, the, what, any country that doesn't let that, that America treat their nation like a fucking playground is an enemy and gets economic sanctions put on them. So this country is just a fucking bully. So um, let's 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 check this out, right? So she goes on. Uh, she goes on deployment, right? Uh, Alan McCloyd wrote this article in the Mint Press News, and he reports that that possibly the the heel turn was accelerated by her. Uh, her recent deployment to the Horn of Africa, right, uh, which she called special operations missions to go after Al-Qaeda-affiliated jihadists, jihadists, which is 
Uh, very nebulous terminology. It sounds very cool, right? It sounds like something you'd see on a bumper of a fucking action movie. A special operation missions to go after Al-Qaeda affiliated jihadists this summer. White Savior, the American dick measuring story, right? Like, that's what it... And then she goes on, on Fox News, and that's all she talks about, right? That's all she talks. She just talks about the 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 jihadists, and she makes rationalizations for targeted drone strikes. Let me see if that's the next presentation here. Yeah. So this is what she said about... This is what she, that she has said about this. this is, and this is a total 180 from her policies before. Her policies before... Uh, we're talking about how shit like this needs to stop. Regime change wars, where we go into countries claiming that we're going after terrorists, is really about acquiring resources and toppling governments. And that, and we've seen that with with the failures in Afghanistan, right? The failures in Iraq, the failure that is Syria, the failures in Yemen. The, the, this is constant. She and she was vehemently talking about this in 2019. So. Now she's on Fox News saying, I think it's important for the American people to understand that Islamist jihadists are continuing to wage war against us. Uh, then barely acknowledging the slain Afghan children were not terrorists, right? Because there was a drone bomb and they killed civilians. Holy shit, is that a shocker? Oh man, if you paid attention to anything WikiLeaks put out, you would know that this is a standard for the American military to, 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 to launch bombs via drones and kill civilians Nonstop. It's what most drone bombings do. I mean, you can say it; they don't, but then you'd just be lying to yourself. And that's fine if you just want to keep lying to yourself and living in your own ignorant little bubble uh, where America is the great white savior. Uh, but that ain't the reality that the rest of the world is in, right? Syria, we just saw that. 70 civilians were killed in 2019, and, and, the, and the Pentagon covered it up. She goes on to say, we have to work to defeat them militarily and ideologically. And militarily, we have two choices in how we do that. Number one, we can continue to invade and occupy in nation-building countries around the world, just as we did in Afghanistan at great cost. Number two, we can take a targeted approach using airstrikes, using our special forces, to go in and go after these terror cells invade and occupy a nation building like we did in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is an objective failure. It is an objective failure from the start of it. And that goes all the way back to the 80s. Th there's, there, there's almost no goddamn mention of, of that. The fact that they were a prospering socialist democracy where women had more rights in Afghanistan in the 70s and 80s than American women have now. Because their government wasn't actively trying to take their reproductive rights away. And America funded what became Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. They armed them. They trained them. Why? Because the, the, the leader of Afghanistan wanted to talk to Russia. Because maybe the leader of Afghanistan thought the Cold War was bullshit. <clears throat> so they destabilized the country. Taliban comes in. We abandoned them. They feel abandoned because they were and and you know the rest as they say is history invade and occupy for nation building that's called imperialism that's called regime change that is the shit that she was against in 2019 and that's a total 180 Total 180 flip from what she was saying in 2019 and earlier, too. It wasn't just 2019 she was saying that. Her career was built on anti-interventionism and anti-imperialism. Let's go to the next slide. So then we have the Modi connection, right? Uh, and, I, and I've talked about the Modi connection before. Um, and one of the things that Alan McCloyd brings up is the uh, the fact that in 2014, when Modi was elected, um, and there was this big fucking to do about bringing him into the states and so on and so forth. And and there's a couple of things to note with this thing, right? Uh, the United States said that they weren't going to let him in. 
because of the atrocities that he was responsible for in Gujarat uh, in 20, I want to say 2011 or 2012. I, I can't remember the exact date. It was before he, be, when he was CM of Gujarat, when he was the government governor of Gujarat, um, basically there was the, a Hindu mob slaughtered uh, innocent Muslims because he never made a distinction between Muslims and terrorists. Right. And this is a problem with Hindu nationalism. This is a problem with Hindus uh, in, in, in a, they don't have to be nationalists. Even, even just mainstream Hindus have a disdain for, for Islam and Muslims without actually understanding or talking to them. Right. Uh, which, which again is fundamentally not Hindu. Uh, so a couple things, this is hypocritical. You're, you're going to deny a, 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 uh, elected leader because they commit an atrocity. America is going to do that. Are you fucking kidding? I mean, the hypocrisy that you like, you just have to ignore in order to be okay with this decision is outrageous. Uh, America is responsible for slaughtering so many Native Americans and stealing their land. And you're going to sit there and chastise Modi for that. Not only that, but uh, when he was elected, uh, rather when he was running to be elected, the Muslim community forgave him. They said, look, this guy, it seems like he wants to do better and, and we're going to give him that opportunity. So we're going to forgive him for his past uh, dis discretions and uh, and move forward accordingly. Right. And he came out and he apologized and he made this statement about his mistakes. And he said that he should have uh, come out and, and spoke out against that sort of extremism. But I mean, none of that mattered. He's been a huge letdown to, to the to the Muslim community. Um, just look at what's going on in Kashmir, right? He he is he has turned Kashmir into the most militarized place on earth, uh, and all of that is to control demographics. And India is headed to being an apartheid state, just like Israel. Not only that, though, but after that, after he was elected and everything, like they did bring him over here because they realized they needed India for business connections. The farm laws from the last segment, man, they need him to write those laws so that American corporations can come in and secure cheap labor. Uh, that That's why they need Modi around. <laughs> Now, the BJP, uh, there was a prominent BJP member at her wedding. And I uh, I do tend to think, well, okay, I know how Hindu traditionalism works. I grew up in a traditional Hindu family. I grew up in a traditional Hindu culture. I am not traditionally Hindu. I've never been traditionally Hindu. Ever since I was, I, like, since birth, I've never been that way. Uh, I think I've always been a skeptical, agnostic humanist. That's just who I've always been, right? Um so I never liked a lot of the traditional shit, but you, you know, you, you got to show your parents a little bit uh, of, of respect. Right. Uh, and, and sometimes your parents are friend friends with shitty people. There's plenty of friends that my parents are, uh, oh, there, there's plenty of my parents, friends that I politically disagree with, but have to be at least cordial uh, at a, at a little family get together. Right. And so the BJP guy gets uh, BJP donors get invited to her wedding I think her second wedding and her father has these connections. They're family friends because Mike Gabbard, who is also a Hindu, uh, a right wing conservative Hindu uh, at, at that. So that's why his friends are in the BJP, which is the right wing conservative party in India, uh, invited them to the wedding. Right. And, and at my wedding, there were plenty of people that I, I met and I was just like, who the fuck are you? But they were friends of my dad that he invited to the wedding and I had no fucking clue who they were. Right. So that kind of shit happens sometimes. She got money uh, from people that belonged to an organization, not the organization itself. Uh, people that were, were I, you know, what you could say, card carrying members of an organization called Friends Overseas, Friend, Overseas Friends of the BJP. Again, these are not people that have direct ties to the BJP. They are just they, they're they're overseas. It's like OCI, Overseas Citizens of of, of India. That that's kind of what this organization was. So the Modi connection was uh, 
a little complicated. Now she's kind of going and 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 championing what what he's doing, uh, and and you have to kind of think. The question I have is: Has she leaned more into this religion? Has she kind of gone into the more fundamental side of Hinduism, which she didn't before? Right, like she wasn't out there protesting Muslims in America, right? She wasn't doing any of that. She wasn't calling average uh, fucking Muslim citizens terrorists. You know, the equa- the parallel she's making now. So I wonder if she went further into the Hindu fundamentalism and then decided the Islamophobia is the direction that she needs to go, right? Because they kind of come in hand in hand. Then there's the LGBTQ shift, which is another one, which is like the anti-war one, which is just like, where the fuck is this coming from? Now, she does have a anti-LGBTQ background, right? Uh, and Alan McCloy talks about that. Uh, Let me see what this quote is. Sorry, guys. Oh, this is a different thing. Uh, Which we're going to get to, obviously. But... She does have a past where where she has an anti LGBTQ past, right? Uh, her dad was an L- anti LGBTQ conservative activist while he was running for uh, office, and when she was in her tw- in her teens and in her twenties, she was part of the conversion camp that her dad would run. Pretty problematic, right? But she did a 180 at that point. She did a 180 at that point, right? People grow, people. But it wasn't a 180 over the course of like six months. This was a 180 over the course of a few years because people grow, people learn, people change. And that's okay. And when they do, it it, it is our duty as people on this side of the fence to say, cool, man, welcome to the club. You know, let let's we'll 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 show you the ropes. We'll show you how to be an ally here. And she backed up her actions. She came out and she apologized twice. She put out a big video when she announced that she was running, and she said, "Look, I did this stuff in the past. I'm not I'm not denying stuff that I did in the past. This is a part of my past, but I'm not that way anymore. I don't believe in those things." And let me show you that I don't believe in those things by legislating accordingly. She got two bills passed, uh, two two bills passed that protect the LGBTQ community from discrimination. And she was convincing conservatives to join those bills, to sponsor those bills. And then all of a sudden it's like, man, you go on Joe Rogan a couple of times and then all of a sudden you're worried about trans kids in sports. First of all, it's fucking sports. The only reason there's any major importance put into sports is because it's a money-making scheme, right? It's because these fucking student athletes uh, can get exploited and nobody can say anything about them because people will then go, well, they need to get an education. If they didn't want to get an education, maybe they should have gone to college. Maybe if they weren't ready to pay for the education, they should have gone to college. And some bullshit like that. And you're denying these trans kids from being able to fucking get an education. And and she makes it about Title IX, which is already overly complicated and uh, and, uh, and 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 fucking unnecessary. And again, my point remains, and this was the same point I made last year, and it's the same point I will continue making when this fucking bullshit Title IX argument comes up. If you are truly going to say that you're a progressive, and I will say that Tulsi Gabbard is no longer claiming stake to that title. She has not said that she's a progressive. Uh, she keeps talking about the, sp- the spirit of aloha, uh, which I don't actually think she knows what that means, probably. But if you are going to say that you are, uh, let, let's not even say uh, title of progressive because she doesn't call herself that, but let's say that you're you're claiming to be on the side of the people, which which she does claim to be, then why would you not try to come up with an inclusive solution to a complex problem, and and rel- and and realistically, kind of a new issue that we really, as a society, haven't had a conversation about. 
Why wouldn't you look for an inclusive solution? Why was your knee-jerk reaction, and it is a knee-jerk reaction, to immediately go to the excluding solution? Where you make it financially harder for trans kids to survive in this country when it's already so hard for them to fucking survive in this country. Now this is the new this is the new stuff that she's that she's saying, right? And it and it's uh, in regards to uh, race and and Rittenhouse, uh, because she sided with the Rittenhouse verdict. Uh, I uh, disagree with the verdict. I disagree with Glenn Greenwald. I disagree with Matt Orfala. I disagree with Tulsi Gabbard here. Uh, it, it, I don't think the argument should be about self defense. I don't think that kid had uh, sure. Yeah. Somebody was coming after him, but Hey, don't the conservatives make this argument about black people all the time. Hey, you shouldn't have been there. You were, Hey, you shouldn't have been looking for trouble. He was clearly looking for trouble. Where, where are the conservatives in, the, in making that argument now? Oh, is it because he's white? That's why you don't want to make the fucking connection. The, the whole trial in and of itself. And, and I'm not going to go into a whole tirade here about the Rittenhouse verdict. Uh, I disagree with it. I think that kid is a murderer. He is a white supremacist. He has been seen partying with white supremacists. He makes white supremacist symbols, and there's a lot of videos and uh, documented evidence where he's talking about killing protesters and, and getting excited about doing that. This kid, it, it, you know, it, it, even Orfala was like, oh, well, he was there to be an EMT and clean up some stuff around there. No, no, no. He went to a Black Lives Matter protest to fucking kill protesters. That's why you had a gun strapped around your chest. You went to a peaceful protest sided with police that have been violent against protesters, violent against the people of that community that illegally shot a man seven times in the back, paralyzing him. And when there were protests against that, you brought a gun to the fucking protests. You were looking for trouble. And when trouble found you, you didn't know what to do because you're a fucking child that has been manipulated under propaganda because you fucking don't know better because you don't know how to think critically and you realize the reality of your situation and killed two people and injured another person you can't say that this dude was there to be an emt guess what man an emt doesn't have a fucking rifle strapped to the front of their chest i've never seen that in an ambulance i've seen ambulance people I've never seen one come out of an... I've never seen a paramedic come out with, an, with a fucking rifle strapped to their chest. That's what that kid was there to do. You can sit there and say it was self-defense. Okay, maybe, but he was looking for trouble, and when he got it, he didn't know what to do. That kid's a murderer and a white supremacist and a racist. He can sit there and go and talk to Tucker Carlson in, a, in, a, in his fucking dad's, you know, hand-me-down suit. And sit there and say he's not a racist, but actions speak louder than words, motherfucker. Actions speak louder than fucking words. And it shows you exactly how tilted, broken, and racist our criminal justice system actually is. They, you, he, they weren't allowed to call his, his victims victims. Evidence was uh, evidence of him partying with Proud Boys and saying shit like, I'm excited to kill protesters. Were, were inadmissible evidence. He's flashing white supremacist signs in photos. So here's what she says. This is what Tulsi Gabbard said, right? In, 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 about the, the verdict. Uh, she says, uh, those, those questioning the verdict had merely had their minds poisoned by, quote, pro-Antifa mainstream, a phrase she has repeated, repeatedly used over the past week. She tweeted, with no evidence, the mainstream media and Antifa-loving politicians immediately labeled Rittenhouse a white supremacist terrorist. It's obvious that he was just a foolish kid who felt he needed to protect people and the community from rioters and arsonists because the government failed to do so. It, protesters, not rioters, protesters. And the dude he shot, other protesters were trying to get that guy out of 
a crowded space. He he was mentally ill. He was not all there. He had just gotten out of the mental hospital. He shouldn't have been at the protest. He was trying to set shit on fire. He saw a kid with a gun and in his state went after him because a kid with a gun looks like somebody that wants to be fucked with. You said it. He's a foolish kid, right? Who felt he needed to protect people. He wasn't protecting people. He was there to kill protesters. He makes jokes about it. This is a colorblind argument, right? The, that, that's what this is. People that come out and make the statements of like, oh, well, I'm not really racist because I don't even see color, you guys. Oh, I'm colorblind. I don't see color. But continue to go on and discriminate communities of color and only, only say disparaging things about people of color and go, well, it's not because of their skin color. I don't see it. But it is about their ethnicity, right? And their ethnicity has a skin color attached to it. All they do is validate those racist ideas after they say, like, I'm not, it's it's basically the, the, the it's the catch-all way of saying I'm not racist, but enter racist comment here. This is not the end of it, right? To, the, the, this colorblind argument goes on because this is, this is some shit she tweeted, and this is just insanity. Is she goes? We are all connected. We are all children of God, no matter our race, religion, or or where we come from. So let us stop racializing. Stop the racialization of everyone and everything. This is what our country and the world needs most right now. What for a kid flashing white supremacist signs and saying he wants to kill protesters to go free? And basically set the precedent that if vig right-wing vigilantes work hand-in-hand -hand with cops, that they will go free because the justice system validates that sort of shit? Man, this is, like, outright insanity. Let's stop the racial... No, you, you can't stop the racialization of issues directly connected to race. The criminal justice system is racist in America. We, we th There's, I mean, a, a mountain of evidence. It, this is just dumbfounding to make a statement like this. If you want to stop the racialization of everything, and talk to your conservative friends, because they're the ones that racialize everything. They're the ones that separate but equal, segregation. That is about race and your skin color attached to that. That's what conservatives want. They're the ones racializing it. All we're doing is calling them out. And then when they get called out, they go, oh, you're just, you're just racial, racialization. <laughs> I'm honestly surprised she hasn't come out with a fucking critical race theory, uh, a stance on critical race theory, where she says some bullshit about critical race theory harming the children of America or some bullshit like that. The GOP has liked her, right? The like the, the right ends up liking her. Uh, not the GOP. That's uh, uh, my mistake for for making that statement there. Um, but the right, the right does like her. There's a lot of commentators on the right. I mean, she's on Fox News. She was going on Fox News before, but primarily to talk about uh, anti-interventionism and fucking Julian Assange, right? Because Tucker Carlson was the only person on, on mainstream media, on corporate media, that was talking about Julian Assange. But the reason why the right ended up liking her was because she was bold and she was sticking it to the Democrats, right? Because she she was the vice chair of the DNC, backed Bernie Sanders. But this is not the same person that backed Bernie Sanders. Now, there is a, there is a chance that this 180 that she's made over the last year, um, and, it, and it is, again, it is it is... 
you started seeing it around, uh, you know, the the blatant shift around the time that she was no longer going to be uh, an elected official. And she's a career politician, right? Um, So this is perhaps a shift for future political runs. Governor of Hawaii. uh, Senate, something, you know. I wouldn't be surprised if we see her make a bid in, in for for 2024 under the Republican Party or the Libertarian Party or something. So this is Lee's quote in regards to that, and I tend to agree with Lee uh, here. Even before I read this, I kind of had this thought. Uh, and when you know uh, someone that you look up to and, and and you're good friends with has a similar ideology, you're like ah, validation. You know, that's kind of the way that I. I saw that, but um, this is Gabbard's switch from championing the oppressed to championing the oppressors. Uh, It's tough to say whether she ever truly believes anything she says or merely just points her trajectory towards the greatest number of clicks and attention. Rather than sticking to her supposed beliefs, she now has recalibrated to the Fox News audience. Most of our ruling elite in most part, both parties are sociopaths who don't actually have empathy for others. Perhaps Tulsi Gabbard has always just been more of the same. And that is that is my belief, is I don't know if she actually believed anything, right? Uh, people that supported her did, thought she did, and it very much appeared that she did believe all the things that she was saying. She was very convincing in that. And she held these beliefs for, for quite some time. It's not like it's not like in 2019, all of a sudden she she decided to be anti-war. I mean, we, we, we looked at her anti-establishment, anti-interventionist uh, policies and beliefs well before 2019. I think I think around 2016 is when I heard of her because she stood up for burning. But all this sounds like is she's going to lean towards what is the popular beliefs and she can change them whenever she wants. I don't know if she believed in anything she was saying. I mean, right now, the evidence suggests that she doesn't, right? That's kind of what what things are veering towards, which really sucks. And and if you're a Tulsi supporter and you and you see this stuff and you see this kind of shift to the right, uh, and you're disappointed, good. I'm right there with you, man. This is super disappointing. Uh, and, but for me, it's not like life shatteringly disappointing because the second she endorsed Biden, um, and and kind of just leaned into the to, to the Democratic establishment a little bit more when she dropped out of the race. Uh, I, I basically was like, okay, that was the last one. That was the last politician that I think I want to back, uh, or support or contribute to, or talk about, um, you know, in, in, in defend in any sort of way. Uh, you know, I, I, I no longer, be- I also don't really have that much of hope and faith in electoral politics, People that watch my channel regularly and fucking know that. <laughs> uh, I just, I just don't, you know. Um, let's look at your comments. Bum, 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 bum. Cynical girl, welcome to the stream. Ba, 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 ba. Let's see. Where are we at? Where are we at? Oh my goodness. The longer segments, it always takes me a little while to fucking find uh the the where the comments started. Uh just because it's a long segment and people say a lot of stuff. Uh cool. There we go. Holly, uh, over on the rock fin, uh says endorsing Biden would broke the deal for me. Uh, yeah, I, I, that was when I kind of just realized, I'm, I'm out, I'm out. Uh, you were channeling Graham Elwood. Yeah, Graham was a lot angrier about it than I was. I was just kind of like, I'm fucking done. Uh, 
I'm fucking done is kind of what I said. Gra- Graham was a lot angry. Graham like demanded his money back and stuff, which was, I was like, man, you're mad. I, I get, I get that you're mad, but damn, you're mad. Uh, Holly points out that, uh, yeah, we trained Osama bin Laden back in the eighties as well. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's part of the whole, let's destabilize a, a, a socialist democracy. <laughs> uh and 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 perpetuate war uh, you know which, which afghanistan is 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 a failure is a failure uh scrolling down oh in in terms of uh in terms of written house uh cynical girl points out he shot someone and then we're told uh, the best thing to do in lieu of, of shooting back is to rush them and disarm them. Uh, people were like, hey, stop that guy. They were doing their job. Yeah, there was a lot of people in that video that were saying, hey, stop that guy. Uh, yeah, I think that guy was... The, the, those those guys were were on point. And Cynical Girl points something else out. You're supposed to rush them and disarm them. That's sort of the way that you're supposed to because they can't shoot a whole bunch of people, I guess. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I'm not an expert in this, uh, but I do know that, that, you know, he was looking for trouble and when trouble found him, he didn't know how to handle it. And, and then two people died. Uh, and then everybody was like, Hey, stop that guy. That guy just killed that dude. Because to those protesters, they don't know who got shot. They, they, you know, it's not like they're the entire history of this person's life flashes in front of everybody's eyes when they die. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure Elon Musk is working on that kind of technology. Um, but yeah, and, and he fled the scene too. That's the other thing too, is, is he fled the scene. If he truly believed that he was in self-defense, he would have dropped the gun and been like, Oh my God, I can't believe what I just did. Holy shit. I feel so remorseful. You're right. I should go turn myself in. But he ran to the cops to find protection. That's what Kyle Rittenhouse did. That's what Kyle Rittenhouse did. Uh, Holly says, I'm not my father's daughter. Sorry, not sorry. Yeah, I'm not my father's kid either. We don't, well, my dad and I don't really have a great relationship, but you know, I, I, I don't want to be anything like my, my, my parents, uh, especially I don't want to be anything like my parents' flaws. Um, so I, I, my, my modeled my life rather differently where it seems like that's what Tulsi was, was doing in breaking out of some of that conversion ter- therapy type stuff. Uh, and then just, you know, fell right back into it because it, it seems more profitable, right? Uh, Let's see. Yeah, I know I've, I've, a, a lot of comments of, of about the uh, about the written house trial. There, 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 there is a lot to say. There is a lot to say in regards to that, and that's a whole different subject matter that I don't want to get into today. Uh, Some Google points out she's center right. Yeah, center right is probably about where she is now, and I think she's tilting even further to the right. Um, you know, uh, uh, and. and it's a shame to fucking see that because it was it was cool to have somebody uh you know that was challenging the the fucking military establishment and that's kind of what she was doing which was great uh you know and, and carl points out is it is it is it a, sh- a surprise or anything uh a little bit if you paid attention to what she was actually saying not the media propaganda uh because she challenged the democratic establishment networks like cnn and msnbc and npr went after her unfairly uh, and I covered how unfairly they went after her because they were asking her more kind of gotcha questions than they would have anyone like Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden or Kamala Harris or anything like that. And and those are politicians you need to grill. First of all, I think you should be grilling all politicians, not selectively grilling politicians over things their parents did, which is what NPR did, um, or their religious beliefs, because – Guess what, man? You're not grilling. NPR isn't grilling Ted Cruz for being a shitty Christian. Right? But all of a sudden, within mainstream media, the religion that I was born into, Hinduism, was being demonized because the Democratic establishment didn't like Tulsi Gabbard's anti-war, anti-establishment platforms. They didn't like the fact that she gutted Kamala Harris on on the uh, debate stage. So... 
your question is it? Yeah, it, it is. It is a surprise to people that paid attention to what she was saying and looked into her history and her legislative history rather than just listening to what uh, corporate media had to say. So that's what my encouragement to you and folks like Carl is. Uh, hey, man, you got to you got to veer away from that corporate media because they're not your friends. And you also. I'm I'm willing to accept that. Yeah, it sucks. I I wish that things were different. I backed this individual, and and now it sucks that I backed this individual, right? But I backed this individual for very good reasons, and I've shared those reasons. And I'm willing to admit that the person I backed is now kind of a piece of shit. But that doesn't change my opinion on what I believed in. I didn't believe in those things because Tulsi Gabbard believed in those things. I believed in those things because I believed in those things. I just happened to gravitate towards Tulsi Gabbard because she also believed in those things and was vocally saying those things. Um, so, so hope that clears that up uh, for folks that have uh, a question like that. Uh <laughs> Uh, Jim says I donated all of a dollar to Tulsi uh, more more than the rest. By the time I was done with Bernie for a bit, yeah, I, I was I was I was disappointed in Bernie as well. Um, I donated to Tulsi's campaign. I'm not asking for my money back, but I also didn't. I don't think I donated the same amount that Graham Elwood donated. I think Graham Elwood probably donated a much larger amount than I did. Uh, and yeah, it's a disappointment, man. When you when you financially back these candidates, you know, um, you don't. Uh, you don't want them to let you down. And when they do, it, it still sucks. Um, but because I had resigned myself in 2020 to no longer kind of champion a candidate, but rather champion ideas and people and the labor movement um, and, and, and veer away from electoral politics, um, I, think, I think my disappointment is significantly reduced, if that makes any sense. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. I'm going. We got one more story to go, and I just want to remind everyone that if you guys are enjoying the enjoying the stream, please make sure you hit the like button and uh, uh, share this out to as many people as you can, and hit the subscribe button to make sure that you're subscribed to get notifications when I go live. Uh, and if you are feeling uh, particularly generous and are in a stable financial situation and would like to become a sustaining member or just make a one-time donation, uh, various different ways to donate over on my website at krishmohanhaha.com slash donate, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A dot com slash donate. Uh, and also I have a bunch of shows coming up. Um, December 10th is the next one. It's a virtual show. It's a fundraiser for the Pittsburgh DSA for the feed, the hood project that they're working on. It's a mutual aid project where they are going to, uh, help feed people in low income neighborhoods in Pittsburgh. So if you want to help that cause, you can grab tickets to that and plenty of other shows on my website. That is, again, krishmohanhaha.com, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, at the end of the show, I, I, Bandcamp is doing a thing where they're giving 100% back to the artists uh, of this Friday. I think they do it in the first Friday of every month. Uh, I have a couple artists that you guys should go check out and and support and purchase their shit, and I will talk about them uh, at the end of the live stream. So stay tuned for that. But let's go to the final story of the evening. Let's talk about Spotify entering the war industry. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of controversy going around about Spotify. Uh, being a giant, huge, massive piece of shit uh, that is destroying the music industry far worse than Napster or the guy from Metallica ever did. Arguably destroying the music industry far worse than Nickelback ever did. That's a big statement. I understand that that's a big statement, but that's how strongly I hate Spotify. I have... I, I have um, Personal reasons to hate Spotify, along with uh, professional and sociopolitical reasons to hate Spotify. <laughs> um, 
Spotify deleted my entire podcast in, in, in 2020. In 2019, I wanted to veer away from, from Spotify anyway, uh, because it's just like, I knew, I knew that they were shit to artists. I think in 2019, I, I made a full, full dollar 20 off of my streams in Spotify in 2020. Uh, every month I would get these notifications about how many listeners and how many streams I got, you know, it's like five or 6,000 streams on Spotify and I got maybe 25 cents for it. Maybe if I'm lucky, I saw a quarter, uh, you know, and, and, and we all kind of knew that Spotify was taking advantage of not just independent artists that release their um, content on Spotify, but we're talking about big artists as well. Uh, nobody but the CEO of Spotify is really making money from Spotify. Uh, the CEO of Spotify and Joe Rogan, who got $100 million uh, to exclusively be on Spotify, right? Exclusively have his show on Spotify. So now um, everybody's doing that Spotify wrapped bullshit that they do every single year. And, I, you know, I participated in it last year as well. And And here's the thing, man. This is why a lot of people, including like lefty, anti-war, anti-establishment comedians like myself and Graham Elwood and Lee Camp and Ron Placone and, um, you know, the, the list goes on and on of all these comics that are on Spotify. It's because we want to be seen by people. And at that point, we had kind of relegated to the fact that, well, we know the people aren't going to leave Spotify just because we're not on it. But I think over the course of the last year... And I also will attribute this to the wave of strikes and labor action we have seen this year. Artists are getting in on that shit too, man. And before we even go on, I will I will let you guys know this. I am not just saying this. Um, I kept my stuff on Spotify, yes, because I wanted to be visible. I wanted people to be able to find my shit, especially when, uh, you know, when people were staying home. Uh, a lot more people were using Spotify. A lot more people were probably getting Spotify subscriptions. Um, so I kept my stuff on there so that people can listen to my stuff. It was also another way to um, have people be able to listen to my stuff for free without having to pay for a download. Right. Because if you have Spotify on your desktop, uh, you can listen to full length albums without purchasing a subscription. Uh, and so I, 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 I kept my stuff on there for that reason. But now, because of all of this stuff, I went ahead and removed all of my stuff off of Spotify and Amazon Music because fuck Amazon, too. Uh, but I did. I, uh, so I think within the next 30 days. You will no longer see any of my stuff, any of my albums on Spotify. The only thing with me on it that you might hear on Spotify is the song that I am on uh, my ex-wife's album. I did one. I did no, I did two songs, I believe, with her uh, on that album, and that is uh, that is the only probably track that you'll hear me on. Uh, if you're listening, if you're trying to find me on Spotify, I would encourage you guys to join other um, streaming platforms. I personally use Pandora because Pandora, again, they're not amazing, but they are, but they pay their artists a lot better. I actually get real money from from fucking Pandora streams. So if you give a shit about your if you give a shit about your artist friends if you give a shit about arts uh, the arts period you get you care about musicians and and comedians and spoken word artists and so on and so forth uh cancel your Spotify subscription man I made that statement yesterday on um on social media and uh, and and I mean everybody was I mean, people were very kind and cool about it where they were like seriously like what do you want us to do divest divest from spotify cancel your subscription get rid of your account that's my next step my next step is to go in and cancel all of the accounts that i have i never paid spotify like i never got a paid subscription but i'm just going to delete my account and then i'm going to delete them from my website i know i you know divest from it Pandora is a little bit more expensive than than Spotify, but it allows you to do basically the exact same thing. And, and your money actually goes to support the artists that you listen to on, on Pandora. 
They have a much better stream rate. Uh, I've heard t good things about Tidal as well. Again, Tidal is another corporate fucking entity, so they're not paying their artists as well as they could. But, you know, pay, uh, Spotify, because comedians, like, from larger fucking comedy record companies were asking to get paid fairly, they just removed... They just fucking removed comedians from Spotify. Yeah, this guy, this guy's a robber baron. This guy's a robber baron. That's what he is. No one goes to Spotify because it's Spotify. People go to Spotify because artists are on Spotify. That's the thing that a lot of people said. Right. Um, that's the thing that a lot of people said. A lot of people said, well, look, I listen to this very specialized genre of music. That's the thing that I like. And I don't know if that's available. I've looked on YouTube. I've looked on this, that and the third and I can't find it. Um, and, uh, you know, I. I don't know what to do. And I and I said, yeah, I, I get it. I understand. But don't you want that specialized genre of artists to get paid well? So, you know, my my suggestion to you guys, and perhaps this story that we're going to go into now it might convince some folks to say, oh, fuck, if that's what my subscription is going towards, I do not want to be a part of that. My suggestion is this. You really want Spotify to know that what they're doing is wrong and will not be accepted by society. Uh, and really strike a blow to capitalists all over the place. Fine. Uh, hit them where hit them towards the only thing that fucking matters to them. Money. But it can't just be one or two people doing it and everybody else going, boy, that's really nice. Good job. No, you, you can say that, but then you have to take the action too. This has to be a large-scale effort. Cancel your Spotify subscription as a consumer. Cancel it deactivate your Spotify account. Don't even do the free shit. Don't even do the desktop shit. Cancel the whole fucking thing. Get rid of your entire fucking Spotify account. And if you're an artist, get rid of your shit from Spotify. Do not keep it on there. You are the reason why, con why customers go to Spotify, not because of the platform that is Spotify. They're going there because there's certain genres of music that they put up. The reason why Pandora might not have it is because Pandora is a little bit more selective, um, especially when it comes to independent music. They're a little bit more selective. They're not as selective with comedy because there's not a lot of comedy on Pandora, but now there might be, which means that they might um, be start becoming a little bit more selective about it. Uh, I, I, I hope not. I hope they kind of open up their uh selectiveness I, I i just hope that they're a little bit more friendly towards the artists again and allow some of these artists that are not getting paid on 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 spotify to join something like pandora and actually earn an income because all of that again if if there's a new wave of customers going to pandora that's that's just good for pandora right under especially under a capitalist model but yeah man cancel your fucking accounts get rid of your music from there switch over to bandcamp Switch over to Pandora. Switch over to Title. I know my shit's on Title. I just got a notification from Title today about the way that they're going to structure their payment stuff. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. I would wager to bed that it has everything to do with this fucking Spotify bullshit. So here's what Spotify is doing now amidst all of this craziness. Amidst the fact that they removed comedy from their platform, not all comedy, but a, a good portion. Like, they took a bunch of fucking comedians out, like John Mulaney, uh, I think Tom Segura, you know, like, I, I, I like these guys. They're not my super huge favorites, but they're very talented comedians. They're very good at what they do, you know, very different from what I do, which is why I, I appreciate them. But they're but they're all gone from fucking Spotify. Why? Because they were like, "Hey, I think we should get paid better," because we're bringing people to your platform. Amidst all of this controversy, 
the CEO of Spotify, Daniel Ek, is now on the board. He bought, he spent 100 million euros and bought a seat on the board of Helsing, which is an AI and war manufacturing company. It's a war corporation that specializes in artificial intelligence. Uh, so this is what the AI does. This is this is what this company does. This is what the Sp CEO of Spotify has invested and become a board member of, right? This is what your money helped him do. Your Spotify subscriptions helped him get on the board of a war corporation that specializes in artificial intelligence. Your money is actively helping black and brown people around the world get murdered. For the sake of imperialism and for the sake of profit. Is that convincing you enough to get rid of your fucking Spotify subscription forever? Do you want your $9.99 a month or your $15.99 a month to go towards death and destruction of not just the human race but the planet itself because the war industry is the biggest polluter on the planet? Here's what this company does. 100 million euros, and he's on the board of this company now. The AI uses cameras from tanks and drones to map out the battlefield in real time so that you can figure out where opponents are and strategically kill them in the most effective way possible, right? And, and if you're some kind of a weird centrist, you go, well, this is just better targeted killing. Well, how about we just stop fucking killing? Why are you justifying murder all the time? It's just, yeah, the, the, like, okay, if you're going to claim it's about terrorists and, and terrorists are killing people, what do you, 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 you think you're just going to go in there and do what an eye for an eye? That's, that's really working out for you guys. I mean, profit wise. Yes, because it's, it's the largest fucking industry in the world. Right. But they basically they're using cameras and building a battlefield in real time. And they've gamified war. So now there can be a disassociation, which means more PTSD. Oh, sorry, more PTSD, I'm sure. Because you disassociate and you and it t gets tucked into the back of your mind and your unconscious makes weird shit happen when you don't deal with things. When, when you don't deal with trauma. And now you're just creating more of it. You're just creating disassociation. Hardened veterans, that's what we need. I wonder if you could use this technology in some way to help transportation. Right? Map out bus routes based on real-time traffic using satellites and drones. Maybe not a warfare application. What about med medical technology? Could you use the same type of AI in real time to map out, you know, the the insides of somebody's body? So if something is going wrong, if their blood blood pressure spiking or there's there's a a mass that's popping up out of somewhere or something like that. In real time, it's mapping all these changes out and letting the, letting the doctors and the techs know. What's Spotify going to use this for? Real time AI? It's all they're going to do is use that for fucking marketing and ads. That's very likely what they're going to fucking use it for. Again, the only reason Daniel Eck was able to be on the board for a hundred million euros, a hundred million euros, a hundred million euros was because of people's Spotify subscriptions and not paying artists properly. He is investing in war technology. Your fucking Spotify subscription is now going to the murder of black and brown people across the world for the sake of imperialism and profit. I will say it again till it sinks in. So that you know and have to be, and, and, and now you have to be okay with that. You have to be okay with your Spotify subscription, your $9.99 a month, your $15.99 a month, and so on. Not only lining the coffers of an already rich man, 
and ensuring that artists who are the reason why people are on that platform don't get paid. But while they don't get paid, this rich man whose coffers you have fucking lined has used that to invest in a company that is making weapons of war to kill people around the world. And if you're fine with that, then go ahead and stay on the platform. That's that's fine. If you're not, divest from Spotify. Cancel that subscription. Deactivate your account. And if you're an artist, especially if you're an anti-war artist, I mean, th th like I was just, I read the article and I was like, cancel all of it. And that's what I did this afternoon. If you're an anti-war artist, you need to no longer be on Spotify. Because if you're bringing your fans and they become subs subscribers of Spotify, all they're doing is contributing to that. Pandora, Tidal, Bandcamp, these are better services. Is Pandora perfect? No. Uh, I don't know if we are, if in my lifetime we're going to see a streaming service of any kind, video or otherwise, uh, that is going to fully treat their artists fairly and give you, you know, what, what you're worth on there. So, I mean, what is in it for Spotify? Ad revenue? Better targeted ads? Real-time AI ads? I don't know. Daniel Eck has not made any comments about this. A lot of people are actually divesting from Spotify once they found out about this. And so I hope you to do too, because you will not be the lone ranger in this. I guarantee you that. I guarantee you, you will not be the lone ranger in, in Spotify divestment. And if you have, if you have a, a very, you know, obscure genre of music or comedy or what have you that you like to listen to, um, and they're not available on Pandora, then, then make your voice heard. Make your voice heard to Pandora, to Tidal, to include these artists so that they don't have to be stuck with Spotify anymore. Now is the time, man. There's the, the, the labor movement is coming back. It's been coming back. We're, we're, we're kind of reaching a crescendo of what we can achieve when we organize together as the working class. Now is the time. Because if we don't push back against these corporations, and if we continue to choose convenience over morality then these corporations are going to continue doing shit like this. Investing in fucking war technology. Not paying the people that are helping them actually earn the money. You created the platform. Cool, man. Thanks. But the reason why people come to your fucking platform is because we're on there. Because artists decided to, to say this is cool. Artists are the ones that made Spotify what it is. Small business is what made Amazon what it is. And the people that make these corporations what they are are the ones that get fucked over the most. And the reason why that cycle of trauma perpetuates is because customers continue to support them financially. I, look, I'm, I'm, I'm just as guilty as everybody else, but I'm trying to do better. Right? I'm not, I don't, I try not to use Amazon as much I, tr I i definitely don't go through them when i need stuff unless i absolutely have to there's like one or two supplements that i need that i can't find on you know at pharmacies or something and and unfortunately they're only available on amazon so we can all do better. We just have to, we just, we just have to do it. It's scary. It's different. It's uncomfortable, right? I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you, it took me months. Uh, and, and, you know, if you give a shit about this, then that is fucking set aside a Saturday, man. That's kind of what I did. I set aside a fucking Saturday 
and got my music and my playlist together. I'm, I'm still kind of putting some of the playlists together. Like my workout playlist is probably not um, full. It, 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 it probably is not as good as it could be. It's probably not as good as it was when I was in college. That's for dang sure. Uh, but it's getting there slowly but surely. I'll remember an artist or a band or an album that I was like, oh, shit, I want to listen to this. Oh, wow. You know, and then I go and find them and add them to my collection. So it's uncomfortable, but we're going to have to go through some discomfort to make everybody's lives a little bit better. If you on an individual level go through two hours of discomfort rebuilding something because you switched over from Spotify to Pandora, and that means that all the artists that you love and support now get to make a little bit more money, and that means that you divested from a company that is investing in death, I mean, is, aren't you going to end up feeling a lot better? That's that's my fucking rationale. That's That's my pitch to you. As some, and I, obviously not to everybody, because I, I don't know if everybody watching is 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 a, is a Spotify subscriber or not. But my pitch to those that are that are watching this now, man, just you know, be brave. You know, make that change. If you want to, if you want the world to be a better place, then you're going to have to take active steps and actions to do that. And as much as we want to pat ourselves on the back by saying we listen to NPR, which fucking also funds war corporations, or rather is funded by war corporations, then isn't it, I mean, aren't you just going to feel better? Cynical Girl points out, Bandcamp Friday, baby. Yes, that's right. Bandcamp Friday. Uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> our, our mutual friend, Cynical Girl points out, uh, Jesse Jett said he made $25 over the whole year on Spotify. That's way more than I have made over Spotify, even with the amount of fucking streams I was getting last year. Uh, yeah. Tweeting uh, rapped shit is just a free advertising for shitty Spotify. And yeah, it's only about the exposure for that some artists are even on there. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, this is one of the things that's frowned upon in in, in the comedy community is exposure bucks, right? Like uh, this happens a lot in New York City where there's a lot of people that are like, bring five friends. We can't pay you, but we will we'll give you exposure to all these audience. You know, the audience that you brought yourself that audience will expose you will we'll give you exposure to them that's what spotify is spotify is is the exposure bucks of fucking the streaming world bandcamp's player is twitter friendly that's great that's good to know as well I mean, you can do a lot of cool shit on on Pandora and Bandcamp, man. Uh, that is something that you should do. Oh, here we go. The dude better quit pay, but buying anything or paying taxes too. Everything supports the war machine. Better go to go on another platform and speak against the war machine so people can hear you. Uh, I do pretty actively go and speak out against the war industry on every single platform. The dude. Uh, and the argument you're making doesn't really make sense. Yes, a lot of shit contributes to the war industry. The war industry is the central focal point of anything run by capitalism, which at current is the entirety of the globe. So in order to start veering away from capitalism and the war industry, we got to start somewhere. So if that start is by divesting from Spotify and starting a movement there, if that start is supporting the labor movement and strike action so that corporations like John Deere and Kellogg and Nabisco actually start paying their workers better, then that's where we need to start. You don't make a better world overnight. You make a better world by changing it from within. In, by going against what the status quo is from the inside and building outward. That's the way that it's going to have to work right now. Sorry, man, your, 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 your cynicism doesn't really make sense and your arguments aren't really holding up.
doesn't help any it's like changing the light bulb to it doesn't help anything except the light bulb industry and actually makes uh, environmental problems worse by having to pretend you've done your part well intentions but uh worthless all right so what's your solution then because at least this is a solution i mean arguments like this are why movements fail man so so you're going to continue choosing apathy because of your cynicism rather than doing something that could actually drive change positively, help the arts community, help the art community gain independence and speak out against the war machine. And art is what drives large movements. So something that could facilitate that you don't want to do because you would rather choose apathy with cynicism rather than do something that drives change. This is the thing I'm talking about, man. Bold action. You're going to come up with excuses because that's what you do. You you have resigned yourself to comfortability in your cynicism. Sorry, man, but I, I, I think you're wrong. And I think your cynicism and apathy are not serving the cause any good. So I, I, would, I would wager that or I would encourage you and challenge you to come up with better reasons to be against supporting artists by divesting from from Spotify. So, all right, folks, uh, that concludes the stream, but I do want to talk about some shows. I mentioned these shows before, but if you didn't catch them, December 10th, I'm hosting a DSA fundraiser for Feed the Hood. Uh, it's a mutual aid pro project. Uh, it is a, a comedy and music show with some fantastic comedians, Zach Funk, Lorenzo De Silvio, Stacey Florim, and kicking the show off is music by Amy mm -hmm. Uh And you get to support a really good cause. Uh, so December 10th, that's a virtual show over Zoom. Grab your ticket. Come hang out with us 8 p.m. December 11th, I'm doing a, a, a virtual show of my stand-up comedy, Citizen Revolution. Uh, December 17th is a live fork full of noodles, virtual recording. And December 18th, if you're in Pittsburgh, it's the last show of the year, and it's an in-person live performance at the Fun House at Mr. Smalls. I'm headlining and doing uh, my new show, The Citizen Revolution. So if you're in Pittsburgh, come hang out with me there. Uh, and make sure that you share this stuff out. That, that's the that's, that's a big way we kind of subvert a lot of uh, social media censorship, big tech censorship, um, especially if you're if you're an anti-war, anti-establishment uh, content creator, they, they suppress the shit out of you. So, uh, please do like share and subscribe. That's a big thing. And, uh, I want to talk a about a couple of people that I think you should go check out, uh, and purchase their albums off of Bandcamp. Uh, Zach Funk, Zach Funk, uh, dot bandcamp.com. Uh, go grab his album. Brains are weird. Uh, I, uh, I hosted that show. So I did the intro. I, I, I did the intro for Zach Funk. No, no, no big deal, but your boy's on that album. Uh, and I've known Zach for a little over a decade now, and we've, we've both kind of seen each other come up in comedy. We both help each other out, uh, with, with tags, with gigs, stuff like that. So he, he's one of my best friends in the world and he's one of the funniest people that I know. Uh, so please go check out Zach Funk's album. Uh, Derek Minto, Derek Minto is another fantastic local Pittsburgh comedian, uh, who you should go check out. And his album is called uh, Live from Lawrenceville's Finest Ham-Themed Restaurant. Uh, and it was it was recorded as the final show at Ham Bones. Uh, rest in peace to, to Ham Bones. That was, uh, that was kind of like the Pittsburgh uh, arts community's cheers. And uh, I, Derek is another person I've known for almost a decade now. And, and we were, we, we, we kind of came up in the comedy scene together, um, you know, and, and, and I've got, I've gotten to see him grow. He's gotten to see me grow. Another really close friend of mine. Mentioned him earlier, Jesse Jett, jessejett.bandcamp.com. He's dropped a new album out. I have, I haven't had the opportunity to check it out. Uh, something I like to do with with new albums that I listen to is not listen to them while I'm working or have any sort of distraction. Uh, when I can find a time to just sit and listen to the albums, that's kind of what I do. I have not had that opportunity yet. So I have not listened to Jesse Jett's new album, but I can tell you that Inauguration Gift is fantastic. The Geiger Age is a really fun album. So there's a ton of stuff that you can find from Jesse Jett. 
uh, old game, old game. If you listen to Forkful of Noodles, you you probably have heard old game. Um, o- old game is is a fantastic band in in Pittsburgh. Uh, super fun band that I've gotten to see live a couple times. Very good. For, uh, Ryan and uh, and Brenda are good friends of mine. Super supportive cats. So uh, go check them out. Uh, Lori Creek, you can find their stuff. Uh, Lori Creek came out with a full length album last year. So go support their shit on Bandcamp. Lori Creek is a band from Norfolk, Virginia, one of my favorite cities. And my dear friends Jesse and Jason. That's that's who uh, is the front of uh, of Lori Creek and the Dapper Dans, Lori Creek and the Dapper Dans. So go check those cats out. Uh, and um, that's really all the names that are coming. To, uh, this is the thing is like when when somebody's like, yeah, name your name, your top five bands. And you're like, ah, uh, dumb, the, uh, the Beano, like you just can't come up with it. That's kind of the place that I'm in right now. Uh, cool. And I think that's going to conclude the stream. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Friday, you guys. Uh, I'll be putting up clips and stuff next week, but the next stream is going to be in January after the new year. That's when the next stream is going to be. I'll probably be putting out some short videos and stuff uh, on these channels over the course of the next few weeks. So uh, with all of that said and done, uh, be good to yourselves. Be good to each other, and we'll see you on the road. Thanks, guys. See you later.